Revelation 16. I'm going to modify things a little bit here tonight just because this poor man's crying too. <laughs> I told Taz when he got hurt at, at men's retreat, I said, you know, I've learned to walk by a basketball goal. That's the funniest thing about it. It's like you not have to play, you know. It's like, no, I know I'm too old. But I didn't play against competition. I played against Anthony. Oh, so, come on. <laughs> I mean, seriously, this morning I beat him 11-1. to 1, And then he, just now I beat him. He made a three-pointer. That was his only shot. I beat him 11-2. to 2. So that's not competition. <laughs> I could beat Tosh right now. <laughs> It hurts though. Uh, Revelation. I had no idea what happened. I thought. I really thought Josiah threw a rock at me. I really thought he took. He just like really sl like had a slingshot or something like bing right into my calf. But uh, he's he promises he's in. You don't have a slingshot, Josiah. You're just as innocent as you can be, aren't you? He's in like. Well, we're in Revelation 16, so we're going to go ahead and read, beginning in verse. Um, 15, we're going to read to the end of the chapter. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Uh, and the seventh angel pulled out his, poured out his vial into the air, and there, came out, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there were upon a, there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now God, please help us to understand the scripture we ask in Jesus' name. So here we are at this scene that is beginning to unfold, and this of course is the final scene that you're going to see. Uh, of God's wrath being executed, His full wrath being executed. And it is, it is uh, remarkably different from everything else that has been judgments in this time. We're still finishing out that seven-year period. We've passed the midpoint of the tribulation period. Now we're into the final period of the tribulation. And in the, mid, in, in the earlier parts of the tribulation period, we saw the seal judgments. We saw the trumpet judgments. And uh, we saw the things that God caused to occur. But now the difference in judgment, and this is remarkable, this is notable. The difference in judgment is that these seal judgments contain the wrath of God. And there's a big difference between when something is happening that is terrible and God, and, the, and between when God is executing His wrath on you. There's a mark, remarkable difference between God's hand of judgment and God simply allowing something to happen. For instance, unleashing devils under the river Euphrates or uh, unleashing these, these locust-like uh, critters that had the power to sting men, to bite men, to torture men, and yet the men could not die. Now we see that God Himself and His wrath and is, is being executed. Matter of fact, if you look back to chapter 14 and, uh, and uh, verse uh, 16, let's read. And he that sat upon the cloud thrust his in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And verse 19, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the winepress of the wrath of God. And that's where we are now. We're in that winepress of the wrath of God. Literally, God's wrath is being meted out. We, we, we won't do first aid for a little bit. I can make it a few more minutes. So, okay, if I pass out, uh, you know, 
then I'd be sorry to almost pass out right before the service. So you'd start seeing spots again, that salty feeling in your mouth. And that's where I was when I was late to pray. So hold the medics for just a bit. <laughs> hey, we're going to make it. Okay. So anyway, I mean, I'm crying inside, though. I'm, I'm sobbing big tears, crocodile tears, just like Tosh. So if you could just imagine me, ah, yeah, that's what's going on inside. Okay. Now, here we see, though, that this wine press, and everybody here is familiar with the wine press, are you? Are you familiar with the wine press? It would be a vat, and in, in, in different cultures, there are different ways, but a vat in which the grapes are all put, and literally either a mechanism presses it out, or people with clean feet, I assume clean feet, get into it and stomp on the grapes until, the stuff you buy in the store, my friend, that's, that is foot juice, I'm just telling you, okay, but the wine press is literally the press where God is going to press out the blood until ultimately it flows up to the horse's bridles, I mean, that would be the illustration. Then these seven angels in heaven, which have these seven great judgments, which we've looked at in the last several weeks, we've been introduced to now. Now remember as well the time period that we're in 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 uh, in uh, the the account of what's going to happen in the future, the revelation of the mystery, which is revealed. Remember the outline of Revelation? Write the things which were, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Okay, so God is very intelligent. And I know I'm speaking, uh, I, that's an understatement, but you know, some people need to know that. God actually knows grammar. He actually invented it. Grammar wasn't invented by people who didn't like false doctrine. Grammar was invented by God. And God knows past, present, and future. And if you read the outline of Revelation, that's the way the book unfolds chronologically, exactly as the outline is. The past is when John is telling about how that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. That's a past event. And he's writing, this is what happened that led up to this event or this mystery, honor, mystery being revealed. Present tense would be the things which are presently going on, and that is the church age. You never see the church mentioned ever again in Revelation after chapter 4. So that's the present tense. And it's the warnings to the churches of what they need to do, what, what the commendations are, as well as what the problems are in the churches. And so, uh, and God's, uh, God's judgment for those churches. We never see the church again after chapter 4. And that will be the things which shall be hereafter. And that's a reminder, my friend, that the, the we're not in the darkness that the day would overtake us as a thief. And that brings us right to our text. Last time that we got together, we, because of our special services, we weren't in Revelation last Sunday night. But if you remember last time we got together, we were in verse 15 of Revelation 16. Behold, I come as a thief. And again, this is almost like in the middle of a letter, a reminder phrase being written to the overlooker or the onlooker. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, how many parents had kids that listened in? Any parents have kids that listened in? All right, kids, go to your rooms. Shut the door and play loud music. Well, probably not to play loud music, but <laughs> go to the room, shut the door. Our house, where I grew up in, uh, for, the mo for most of my life, uh, matter of fact, every house I ever lived in had steps. And stairs are a great hiding place for kids, actually, when, when adults are having a serious conversation and don't want them to listen in. And so we had in uh, our, our ca house that I grew up mostly in, we had, it was a bi-level, and so when you came in the front door, there was a dividing wall, and, and a flight went downstairs, and then a flight went upstairs. So you could get all the way up to the dividing wall right here, and then everything is open in the living room and kitchen where you could hear what's going on. And many a time was spent sitting at the base of that flight listening to our parents' conversations. And uh, every now and again, something would be said like, boy, if those kids are listening in and I catch them, I'm going to spank them so hard, you know, or something, something like that. So right in the middle of the conversation, you know, you have a phrase dropped. And the phrase was not really dropped so that mom would hear or so that dad would hear. It was dropped so that the listener in her would hear and flee. And so this is sort of that kind of a phrase right here in the middle of Revelation. Uh, judgment has never been for the righteous. Judgment has never been for God's people. And that's why there's this warning right here in the middle. We're reading this, and we're told, Blessed is the one that readeth the words of the prophecy of this book. And so there's a blessing, and there's a warning here. And one of the things we're warned about is Jesus is coming as a thief. And even though we're at this place and the church is no longer mentioned, who do you think this is written to? 
This behold, I come as a thief. The same one that wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Ye are not of the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Remember, we looked at this the last time that we were together. We looked at uh, Matthew 24 and, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, and uh, Luke, or Matthew 24, was it uh, Mark 16? We looked at um, when Jesus said, What I say unto you, or is it Mark 13? Oh, man. Mark 13. What I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. And then uh, uh, Matthew 24, when the disciples asked Jesus three questions. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy, signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Three separate events. And Jesus began by saying, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for the end is not yet. And my friend, we'll always hear of wars and rumors of wars, won't we? It's always something on the horizon, something brewing. And really, geographically, all that matters is where you're located because there's always a war. And whether you know the war is a big one to you or not really has to do with whether or not you're directly or indirectly involved in it. If you're not involved with it, it's, you know, it's a distant thing. It's a terrible thing. But if you're involved in it, it's, of course, the biggest, most dramatic, most traumatic thing, if you can understand that. And so <clears throat> we know that the signs don't preclude or are not a prelude to Jesus' coming. The things that Jesus is talking about happen after His coming. And that's why He said, I come as a thief. And that's the thing, that's the event that is coming. And even in the middle of a passage where we're already into the time that Jesus has come, there's a throwback statement or phrase coupled in the middle of this uh, literature that says, Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And that's written to the church, I believe. It does have double fulfillment, though, doesn't it? Because if you read the Revelation after the church is taken out of the world, by the way, that's not going to be a mysterious you know, they disappeared kind of thing. This whole abducted by aliens nonsense. I heard Christians say, yeah, this whole extraterrestrial life, you know, and whether or not there are alien, there's alien life and so forth, that's just a cover for when the Christians disappear and they try to explain it. No, my friend, I'm going to tell you how it's going to be when Jesus comes and takes uh, His church. He's going to come in the sky. And just like the angel said, this same Jesus which He saw uh, ascend into heaven shall so come in like manner as He saw Him ascend into heaven. So Jesus is coming the same way He went. The disciples watched until a cloud received Him out of their sight. Every ascension uh, was that way, by the way. Elijah was that way. You know, he just they watched Him. Up He goes. And, and then He was taken up uh, by, what was it, chariots of fire and, and angels and chariots of fire. They saw it. There's not going to be a mystery about what happened to all the Christians. We're going to be saying, told you so, goodbye. When they go up, and everybody's going to know it. Man, I hope, I pray to God that I'll be preaching the gospel with somebody and I would love to be telling them about Jesus taking up the saints. Can you imagine the effect of that message? Hey, listen, uh, Jesus is going to come and, and the church is going to be taken up out of the world and if you don't get saved, you're going to be left behind and I just start going up and I'd be like, wait for me! <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, by the way, I hope you're practicing your Superman move for that. You know, the Bible says in a moment and it says in it, in a twinkling of an eye. But that's talking about the manner of Christ coming. In other words, it'll be very, very suddenly. And it will only be anticipated by those that are thinking all the time, I think Jesus is coming now. And if you think Jesus is coming now, you'll be ready, exactly as the Scripture forewarns. But the fact of the matter is, is that that's the manner of Jesus coming. It's not the manner of our ascending. We're told that Jesus is going to ascend the same way that He went. He's going to come the same way that He went. And so it's assumed that we'll go the same way that Jesus went. And so this idea of a flash and we're gone, no. Jesus is going to come and He's going to receive us up. And the Bible says that uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, so we're not going to prevent them which are asleep. So the bodies of the dead who have been in heaven clothed with temporary bodies will be raised up before us. So that's all going to happen at that time. And that's going to be a rather amazing phenomenon. It would be great to be around a, um, a grave, you know, maybe in the south. We, you know, a church grave where, you know, hopefully the people in the cemetery were, were saved, were Christians, and just watch the bodies come out, you know, or be there and watch them go right before you, like, I'm next, and then off we go. Where and are they now? What? Where are those people now? Where are they? They're in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says. And so that's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 that we're going to be, uh, when we put off this tabernacle, the word for tabernacle in that passage is the word that we use for a tent or a temporary structure. And uh, then our ultimate bodies would be the word that we'd use for a temple or for a permanent structure that is a house. So you could, you could even picture the difference uh, regarding the dwelling place of the spirit or the soul of a person. Um, you could picture the difference between when Israel traveled and they had a tabernacle they set up in the wilderness. 
than when the temple was actually built a solid structure. So they will be in a temporary body, but when God resurrects their mortal body, then they'll they'll put on the they'll, their their body which is resurrected. And that's a good question. You know, a lot of Christians have never thought about that, and there's just a lot of things they haven't really thought through. That is why when we talk about a Christian burial, we uh, we reject many Christians, and I do personally. This is not don't don't feel as though I look down on somebody or anything, but I reject cremation. I don't think it's a good option. I, it's, it's fine with me if you want to toss my body in a ditch or bury me in sea or whatever. But I want my body to be together simply because I want the testimony that I believe in the resurrection. In other words, I don't want to be uh, have my ashes spread. I, listen, God can raise me up from ashes. There's no trouble here with God's ability. That isn't the problem. But uh, I do want my body to be in one place just so that, you know, I, it'd be, it's going to be a weird resurrection if you scatter me all around. That could be interesting. But, you know, kind of like, <laughs> you know, coming together, you know. But uh, it is important, I think, everything a Christian does is important by way of our testimony to the lost. And in pagan cultures, a Christian burial is an amazing testimony. It's a, it is something that is remarkably different from the customs that they do. And the reason is because we believe in the resurrection. So that's why Christian marriages and Christian uh, funerals are important. It's because of a recognition that there's a God who's going to raise us up from the dead. So does that answer the question? Okay, good. Any other questions before we move forward? That, that's off topic, but... It's a, it's a really sound question. And I think everybody ought to think through that and answer it. <clears throat> very similar very similar to the questions that many people have about hell, paradise, heaven, and the lake of fire, right? Uh, it, Luke 16 is really insightful with regard to that, answering that question. Because you have Abraham's bosom and then you have hell. And you have a gulf fixed between those two. But we know that when Jesus was resurrected, when he was raised from the dead, that the saints came out of the graves. And uh, they went into Jerusalem and they were seen of people. What happened to those saints? Well, when Jesus went up to take his blood in the throne room of God the Father, he took the saints up with him. So their, their physical bodies are already, uh, they're, they're already physically resurrected. They were uh, waiting, they were waiting down in uh, paradise, but now they're in heaven. And that's what is so remarkable about the statement to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because until the cross, until the work of the cross was completed, my friend, everybody was waiting. Everybody was waiting. But after the cross, my friend, we instantly have access to God. There are things that are going to happen as future events, such as the things that are in the Revelation. But I hope that those, I hope that those are answers to things uh, that maybe you have questions of, because it isn't the message tonight. And so, <laughs> all right, so let's get back on topic again, if we will. Uh, back to Revelation 16. Again, I said in verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Your testimony is important. And that's exactly what it implies in, in uh, both the church age as well as for the person that will be reading this after the saints are taken up. Now, I want to focus on verse 16 through 21, and we'll make some comments when we finish this evening. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. It's really interesting, actually. Uh, this is simply two Hebrew words that means the hill of Megiddo. Um, and it's really a tell. You know what a tell is, right? A tell is a hill that is a result of cities. Um, cities being basically destroyed and built on top of another until actually you end up with a hill. So it's an artificial hill. Armageddon is an artificial place. And it would be in the, I believe it's the northern part of Jerusalem, though I have not myself been there. I've seen pictures of it. And it's a kind of a pretty area, actually. Um, sort of like Sample Road, you know, where we have, the, we have uh, Mount Trashmore. Uh, <laughs> in, in this area. You know, so I'm sure there'll be a golf course on it before it becomes, actually there's a city there now that was settled by uh, Holocaust survivors in the 1940s uh, after the... Um, after they went back to, to establish the Palestine or establish uh, Israel in the land of Palestine. And so there is a city. I think there's about 7,000 inhabitants there. But this is going to be the place where the 144,000 who have taken the seal of God on their foreheads are going to be gathered together. And then we're going to see the destruction of Babylon. We're going to see, uh, and that's what we see in verse 17. The Bible says, And the seventh angel poured out a vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven, from the throne saying, it is done. Now there's there are similar words to that, aren't there? Similar statements to that. What does that invoke for memory for you? 
It is finished. It is done. And this literally is, if you will, the end of God's mercy. This is it. Finito, finished, finalized. God is finished being merciful. He's finished. And so now, again, we're in the wine vat, if you will. We're in the wine press. The wicked are. The righteous or the 12 tribes that make up the 144,000 collected with them those individuals who have joined them but are not part of Israel. Though, but are part of Israel as proselytes, if you will. Those individuals are, <clears throat> are onlookers, but now God is about to himself come down. God's son is about to come down. He's about to deal with Babylon. First of all, we have a we have the verse 18, voices and thunders and earthquake. And the uh, Bible says, such as was not since man was upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. I have dear friends who have been through earthquakes. Uh, did you know that Oklahoma is tied with California now for earthquake possibilities? News article, I think, something like yesterday. It's the fracking, folks. Donald Trump did it. Caused an earthquake. Oh, no. For sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but Oklahoma's got earthquakes. California, hopefully, is falling off. I shouldn't say that. I love California. If you could make some people fall into the ocean and keep the rest of it, really, it's a beautiful place. But, uh, you know, nuts like beautiful places, I think. And so <laughs> California is supposed to fall off. And they've had some pretty good earthquakes, so much so that even in places like Oklahoma now and California for a lot of years, construction is different. I, it, construction of any kind, I'm not a builder, but construction's always fascinated me. I have a mechanical mind, and I've always wondered, how do you build a house when the ground underneath it might split in two? You know, what's the, what's the thing you do? And they actually build in slabs. They actually make them so that they um, have sections that actually are able to move like this and for the foundations to stay in place and so forth. So construction's pretty neat in those places. They have pretty bad earthquakes in California. Of course, uh, Japan, I think, and Haiti. Haiti had a terrible earthquake. I believe the Japan earthquake was one of the worst, and Thailand also has had a severe earthquake in the last few years. But uh, the Bible says there's never been an earthquake on Earth ever like this one. And then look at the next judgment. The Bible says, uh, by the way, uh, I want to point out the reason. The reason I made that point, I want to. I didn't finish the thought. The Bible says, "Such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty, an earthquake, and so great." I want to remind you of this. This is not a "What do you make of these earthquakes?" kind of an event. You ever sit on a plane next to somebody? They find out you're a Christian. They say, "So what do you make of all the things that are happening?" And they want you to say, "The end is coming because of the wars, rumors of wars, and and the supernatural or the unnatural weather, which has caused." you know, by Donald Trump. I like saying caused by Donald Trump just because it's a lot of fun right now. Is Donald Trump a lot of fun in Canada? You, you folks enjoying him up there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, he can't control the weather. <laughs> the, the oil, the guys that are drilling for oil and fracking can't do this. In other words, this earthquake is such that everybody said only God. I mean, you take the natural disasters, and I've, I've seen and been in some, some disasters. I was in Hurricane Katrina, and uh, I mean, I was in it, driving in it, heading down with, to, with the generator to Gulfport, Mississippi, where the brunt of it hit. And I'll just tell you something. I cannot describe the, the scope of the devastation of it. It's really terrible, but it was a hurricane. You say, was God judging the casinos? Well, I don't know. They got judged for sure, but I don't know. But I'm just telling you, this earthquake... It's going to be one of those things where it's split up so badly that only God could do it. I mean, it's like God did that. There's no, do you think God's doing something here? No, God is doing something here. Do you see the nature of this judgment? Then hailstones. Uh, these hailstones are the weight, the Bible says, of a talent. That is 751 pounds. That's, that's almost more than I can lift. <laughs> right now, because I only have one calf. And I do all my lifting with my calf muscles. So... Why do you laugh? Why did people laugh when I said that? You don't think I can lift 751 pounds? Mrs. Price knows I can. Okay, good. My wife thinks I can, so that's all that matters. The rest of you doubters uh, don't matter. And maybe I can lift 800 or more, can I? That's right. Okay. So make fun all you... Not right now. 
<laughs> but make fun all you want to, you doubters. You can't lift 200 pounds. That's why you're laughing. Because your limitations. Okay, I'm striking back on some of these things. That wounded me deeply. Right in my calf. Um, the Bible says in verse 19, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And the Bible says, And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of his wrath. The Bible says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a landscape running away from God? Think of that. Literally, God's fierce wrath is so terrible. You ever see somebody, you know, that sort of has a wake, you know, about them? You know, a wake is, you know, like when a boat throws off a wave. Mrs. Price, why is that funny? What did I say? You're not laughing at me again, are you? Okay, all right. But, uh, you know, when a boat throws off a wake, you know, it leaves a, a, you know, a big wave behind it. Literally, God's wrath is such that His presence is making islands run just like, whew. You know, here see somebody angry, it's like, oh, they're coming, and everybody ducks and hides. You know, some of y'all, that's your wives. Okay? <laughs> Not mine. Some of you, you know. When you, and you say, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about the wrath. We're talking about, I mean, in all seriousness, and this is so serious, it's really hard to really grasp the kind of fear. Because the fact of the matter is because of the blood of Jesus Christ and because of the nearness, because we who were once so far off have been made nigh. We really... Um, are conditioned to the boldness that happens because of having a righteousness which is not our own, the righteousness of Jesus. And so the fact of the matter is, though we should fear God in His holiness and His righteousness, we don't have the kind of understanding of the character, the nature, and the wrath of God to fear Him. I mean, you want to talk about fearing God when islands are fleeing, that's, that's scared. That's frightened. Is it not so? And so this is the precursor, this is the prelude to the events that boggle my mind and we're really introduced to the attitude that brings the events. And the events that boggle my mind is really the, the rebellion of man, the, the, the willingness to, in spite of God's fierce wrath, to say, I will not bow. And to literally come out to meet God for battle. They've hidden in caves previously because of plagues and judgments and said, you know, beg for the rocks to fall on them so that they could die. And yet when God comes in His wrath and the islands flee away, these individuals are in such a state of insolent rebellion that they literally come at God and the fierceness of His wrath. To anyone who would think that they stand in the place to judge God and His motive for destroying the wicked. My friend, you've missed the point. The rebellion is, of man is such that God can't work with it. That's why men go to hell today. I'm reminded as I look at this and I, and I, and I think, what is wrong with these people? Why do they not bow? Why do they not, they not fall on their face and beg for mercy? I'm reminded that men today are dead in their trespasses and sins. They have the convicting of the Holy Ghost. They have the Word of God to show them the truth. And they do not bow and fall on their face and cry out for mercy. And my friend, the nearness of the actual executed wrath of God in person makes no difference to the reality of the fact that God is the judge of the wicked today and in the future. And the Bible says, And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. 751 pound rocks, stones, hailstones, falling from the sky, and men say, How dare you, God? Our application, again, is the same as it was a few weeks ago, and it's twofold. Who are you to reply against God? Who is anyone to reply against God? My friend, God is merciful. God is long-suffering. And the circumstances of your events may cause you to say, God, I'd like to understand. But you have never and will never face circumstances that will ever make you justified in saying, God, you don't have the right. Whether you're saved or whether you're lost. What is your attitude? 
to circumstances that have to do sometimes even with God's wrath. I've been surprised sometimes watching Christians go through chastisement. You know, chastisement isn't mysterious. When you look at chastisement, one of the things you'll understand about it is that it's always in nature or in kind of sin. In other words, when something happens in your life, it's healthy, I think, to say, okay, let me stop and think about this. Why is this happening? It's smart, isn't it? It's intelligent. But the reality of it is if your chastisement has nothing to do with anything you've done, then it's a circumstance that God is using in your life to teach you patience. But if it's the nature of it is connected with that which you have done, like play basketball, for instance. Um, I shouldn't be silly because I'm making a serious statement. Uh, if it is in, connected with the nature of something you have done, then, my friend, it is chastisement. And I have seen believers who refuse to acknowledge chastisement. I don't know why this is happening to me. And essentially the same thing they're saying is, how dare you, God? This isn't right. And friend, God is merciful. And as recipients of His mercy, we ought to always just bow when we're chastised. I say, yes, Lord, thank You for the chast... Thanks for getting me right because I don't want to be the guy that faces Your wrath. And if you're lost... The circumstances of God's judgment ought to make you bow and say, God, I don't want to be the recipient of your wrath. Thank you for Jesus. I want Jesus. And I'll remind you, my friend, that no one has ever lived, never has grace been more free, more universally offered, and more available than it is today. And in many ways, we ought to take full advantage of it. We ought to take full advantage in receiving it, and we ought to take full advantage in preaching it. Because that's the character and the nature of this same God who one day will have had His long-suffering and His mercy used up. Father, thank You for what You've taught us tonight. I pray that You would help us to live and apply it. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for your good attention. You're dismissed.